All right, before getting started, I have to make something very, very clear. When I say the phrase BLM or Black Lives Matter, I'm talking about a codified nonprofit charity organization called BLM GNF. This refers to Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, which operates an umbrella company supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. This is extremely important because there's a difference between corporate entities and conceptual ideas. Black Lives Matter as a concept is not something I'm trying to disparage in the slightest right now or even discussing today. However, Black Lives Matter as a global charity is a disaster. To lay all of this out, I need to make a few distinctions and build a foundation. Black Lives Matter as an institution was founded and grown between the years of 2014, roughly, and 2016. During this time, and also going forward until about 2020, Black Lives Matter Global was not an actual self-governed charity slash nonprofit organization because it utilized financial partners, two of them to be precise, called Thousand Currents and Tides. These were partners that handled, among other things, inflow and outflow of capital, most importantly, which positioned BLM as a non-public charitable company, but not a traditional nonprofit. In the grand scheme of things, this period of time doesn't really matter. There are some scandals surrounding these financial partners, sort of, but for the sake of clarity and precision, we will focus directly on BLM right now and speak about the most relevant period of time, which is mid to late 2020 and going forward. November of 2020 is when Raymond Howard, remember that name, signs an affidavit attached to the bylaws of what we now know as BLM Global Network Foundation. These bylaws, containing information on the general structure and individual duties of different BLM executives, also contains the following, quote, Section 4.4, Executive Director. The Executive Director shall be the Chief Executive Officer of the Corporation. He or she shall have charge of all funds and securities of the Corporation, shall endorse the same or deposit or collection when necessary, and deposit the same to the credit of the Corporation in such banks or depositories as the Board of Directors may from time to time authorize, end quote. That's the important part. He or she shall have charge of all funds and securities of the corporation. And in July of 2020, according to their own website, a woman named Patrice Cullors was named as executive director of the soon-to-be official BLM Global Network. Let's recap. BLM, for the first five or so years-ish, was an organization with financial partners who made it possible for them to avoid the official charity classifier, meaning that they were not subjected to standard disclosure requirements. In 2020, they made the switch and appointed Patrice Cullors to the position of executive director. Now, during this transition, something else happened as well. As BLM began to step back from their initial partners, they needed to assume financial independence as well. According to documentation from Baker Tilly, as per the filings of Thousand Currents themselves, there would be a transfer of $66.49 million directly to BLM Global. This transfer was approved in October of 2020, and also, one last item, in December of 2020, BLM Global was officially recognized as a charity organization, gaining tax exemption status from the government and becoming subject, plain as day, in the notice right there, black and white, to mandatory 990 form completion, which makes certain financial information public, of public record and available to everyone, in accordance with laws pertaining to their status. BLM became a fully-fledged, nearly $100 million in totality global charity with strong grassroots awareness in the United States especially, and an official corporate structure. What could go wrong? The answer? A lot. A lot can go wrong, and a lot is going wrong, because this company's financial reality is a disaster. Let's start with BLM's very own snapshot, financial snapshot, for the 2020 fiscal year. This is a pretty lengthy PR and marketing puff piece, if you will, but one section has some very important figures. According to BLM Global themselves, 2020 was a year in which 90, just in 2020, by the way, $90 million were raised. The general breakdown included $8.4 million in operating expenses, and most importantly, $21.7 million in grants dispersed to more than 33 organizations and chapters, chapters being individual groups of BLM activists spread across the country. Here's where things start to get pretty interesting. Reported by AP News, a group called the BLM 10, composed of 10 highly prominent chapters in the movement, have openly begun to state that they receive no financial support whatsoever. The reality doesn't seem to match the picture here, and since birth, BLM as a corporate structure has failed to adequately support their individual chapters, by those chapters' own claim, that's their words, not mine, culminating in a year where, supposedly, $90 million came in and $21 million went out. Interesting, but let's go even deeper. When actually applying for their status of tax exemption, BLM filled out various different financial statements. One of those statements contained the following. 
This right here appears to be a claim that $12.7 million were spent on professional fees, which is similar to operating expenses, but not nearly the same number. What's going on here? To explain this, I need to jump around a bit and showcase a little bit of context on how exactly this movement's governing executives, primarily Patrice Cullors at the time, feel about transparency. This right here is a YouTube video from an interview Cullors did in April of 2022. In this interview, she says the following. Like, for a long time, you know, I'm not at Black Lives Matter anymore. I left last year, but for a long time, we weren't a nonprofit on purpose. We took seven years to become an actual 501c3. And the, these two short years, not even two years yet, that we've been an actual 501c3, it's been so under attack. Wow. It, this doesn't seem like, this doesn't, this doesn't seem safe for us. This 990 structure, this nonprofit system structure, this is like deeply unsafe. Like this is being literally weaponized against us, against the people we work with. I can't tell you how many people are like, am I next? That's a really odd quote when you consider the fact that this 990 structure simply refers to government subsidized charities being required to make certain financial disclosures something that BLM to this day has not ever adequately done, but more on that later on. She describes the term 990 as triggering, and in a vacuum that might seem entirely nonsensical, but with some further context we can start to understand why. Publicized financial disclosures as a general concept here is basically now the enemy of BLM Global. It turns out that Patrice Cullors in 2016 and beyond, during and after the BLM movement began to gain traction, nationally speaking, purchased not one, not two, not three, but four expensive real estate properties for over $3 million total. One of these was a mini compound in LA for over $1.4 million, purchased in early 2021. Other reports allege that she was even browsing property at elite and extremely private locations worldwide, such as the Albany, a real estate source in the Bahamas. Focusing on only what has been categorically proven, Patrice Cullors bought over $3 million in luxury homes, right during the same period of time where Black Lives Matter was receiving donations. And though it's very difficult to prove a direct link between these two realities, we do have a bit of paperwork here. One connection that stands out particularly bad is a partnership between a company named Trap Heels and BLM, where BLM Global, plus a couple other activist groups Colors led at the time, paid nearly a quarter million dollars for an election night live stream and general consulting. But Trap Heels was only formed a couple of days before partnering with BLM directly in the first place, and was created by the father of Patrice Cullors' own son. On many separate occasions, there were interviews and articles about the connection between these two figures, an activist leader and an emerging artist commissioned for hundreds of thousands of dollars by BLM-associated groups. And not once did either of them acknowledge that they had a child together. By itself, perhaps not all that impactful. It really isn't, but we are really just getting started here. Looking at the board and officers list for Black Lives Matter Global, we see three different names. Patrice Cullors, Shalomia Bowers, and Raymond Howard. This is where it gets a bit complicated, but bear with me because these names are going to start forming kind of a pattern. Black Lives Matter Global isn't just one entity. It's a network. That's very important. Within Black Lives Matter Global are things like the Black Lives Matter PAC, also known as the Black Lives Matter Political Action Committee. They love to use committees. Or Black Lives Matter Grassroots. There are many of these groups, which are almost always led by the three individual people we just named. Example, Shalomia Bowers is the agent of records and the treasurer for Black Lives Matter PAC. One of the specific names we can focus on is Reform LA Jails. This offshoot of Black Lives Matter actually has records we can look at, unlike most of the organization, which is pretty rare if you think about it, and those records are extremely interesting. But even more interesting is this. In official documentation for the Reform LA Jails Committee, we can see that a man named Christman Bowers is the treasurer, and Patrice Cullors is the controlling office holder. Bowers, Bowers, where have I heard that before? What's even better is that the medium profile for Shalomia Bowers is actually at Christman, which would indicate to me that there is a very clear link between these two people, who I don't even think are different people, just one man using different names on different sections of the BLM spiderweb. Over the span of just a few months, this committee within BLM sent tens of thousands of dollars to not one, not two, but all three of these BLM global executives through connected, what I would describe as shell companies. 
First is a series of payments to Bowers Consulting, almost $20,000 at a time. And Bowers Consulting shows its founder and president on their own website to be Shalomia Bowers. Next, not even two months later, within the same actual financial statement period, the same offshoot of BLM sent tens of thousands of dollars to Janaya and Patrice Consulting. That's the one owned by Patrice Colors. And right around the same time as well, tens of thousands of dollars were being sent to none other than Trap Heels LLC, the company owned by the father of Patrice Colors' son, that had been created just days before an initial partnership with BLM. There's more. BLM Global also formed a public relationship and partnership, financial partnership, with a company called New Impact Partners. As quoted on their homepage, Raymond is the one who said this. Well, Raymond, perhaps being none other than Raymond Howard of the BLM Global Leadership, is the brother of the woman who created New Impact Partners. And when confronted with this information, the quote was deleted, Howard purged his entire LinkedIn profile of anything mentioning BLM, and now the only references available are from internet archives. The spider web just doesn't end. Over $70,000 was funneled during that same two-month period to Carol and Asha Bandel, Incorporated. Asha Bandel is the woman who co-wrote Patrice Culler's memoir years prior, and this is all happening through a committee to reform LA prisons? Hundreds of thousands of dollars are being funneled in just this tiny little snapshot that's available to us into connected consulting firms that the executives on the committee own themselves, as well as their direct family members and personal friends. This is just one of the subcommittees that BLM Global contains, and nearly all of the others that I have looked at are owned and controlled by the exact same people. What makes matters even more suspect here is the behavior when confronted. This video right here, a re-upload by the way, is the one-year reflection on BLM's progress after George Floyd. This video takes place at a $6 million mansion bought and paid for by BLM Global, and they also kind of tried to obfuscate that fact. When confronted by this, Patrice Colors deleted all content from her entire YouTube channel, which I believe contained other videos shot from the same location as well, and went dark. She had resigned from the position of director immediately after scrutiny over her multiple million dollar homes broke out, but maintains that all of this is entirely unrelated. The problems never end. After Patrice Cullors stepped down as director, the organization named two other prominent activists as the next co-directors. But those activists had to clarify on social media that they actually have nothing to do with BLM and could not accept the job because they could not reach an amicable agreement, even though BLM had told everyone that they were now the next co-directors, right? So there's a breakdown of communication there, at the very least. The office for BLM Global, this is a good one, listed on multiple government documents it's not real. Both the actual and misspelled versions direct to locations that have no connection to BLM. More recently, the organization used an accounting trick to avoid filing complete 990 forms. And remember, the ex-director is triggered by 990 forms. And as a result, fell out of legal compliance in 10 different states around the country. Some of those have resumed, actually, but their spotty reporting is a chronic and recurring problem. Another example would be the Reform LA Jails Committee, which as far back as 2019 was already being warned for failing California compliance requirements, even back then. In a letter sent to Mr. Bowers, it was stated that the group is not performing their legal obligation when it comes to filing semi-annual reports, and this pattern of neglectful or even non-existent financial transparency plays out across the entire organization. What I see, and in my opinion, this is a spider web of insiders using shell companies funneling money into their own pockets. The current situation seems to be that there are tens of millions of dollars just sitting somewhere or floating around as people try to get their hands on it, but hardly any of it actually goes to, or will ever get to, the people it was intended for. As a result, when we think of BLM, it's important to acknowledge a separation between concept and company, because conceptually there is support, but from a corporate perspective, BLM is an unmitigated disaster that is being rightfully scrutinized and criticized. Again, important distinctions need to be made here. The actions of three leaders do not necessarily reflect on the entirety of a movement, but having actually looked at the organization itself over the past year or so, I thought it was time to do a video. That's it though. Links are down below to support. Please consider Patreon or Locals. It's just for the channel and the content, so demonetization doesn't really affect... A anyway, this, this kind of topic usually gets demonetized. That's why I'm plugging this. Also, Odyssey, a completely free YouTube alternative. A few other things, but I'll keep it brief this time. The outro, that is... Thank you all for watching and have a nice night.